All right, coming to you live from Basel, Switzerland. I'm here with Ian Andrews from Pivotal. Ian, how are you? I'm terrific, Martin. Good to be doing this again. It's the one-year anniversary of our last video that, shoot. That is, and, and may it be as successful as our last. Um, so, what do you do at Pivotal? Uh, my title is Vice President of Products, so that means I look after all of our outbound messaging, uh, our, our corporate marketing functions, analyst relations, uh, and, and a bit of our product strategy. Perfect. So you're the guy I want to talk to, right? So there yep. was there was some announcements um, made here, basically around what do you call things? How do you uh, how do you um, talk about them? How do they fit together? So. Maybe you could just walk us through it, and if you could sketch it out, that would be awesome. For sure. So the, the big announcement uh, that's got the conference buzzing, because it's the Cloud Foundry Summit, is we actually introduced a, a new offering related to Kubernetes. Uh, so we're calling this the, the container service, but it takes Cloud Foundry Bosch, and it takes open source, uh, stable release of Kubernetes, and puts them together. And so for people who may be uh, heard it before I knew it as Kubo yep in fact recently I said to someone how are Kubo and the container runtime different oh yeah so uh, take it from there well so the uh, you know the, the genesis of this project was about a year ago uh, we had had a couple of customers come to us at Pivotal and say hey you know we've got uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry we love it things are going really well Terrific developer productivity, operational efficiency, uh, security availability, like, it's awesome. We've also got some workloads that don't fit on Cloud Foundry super well. So we've got, um, uh, we've, we've also got to run Kubernetes to support those. And unfortunately, we're running into some trouble, like upgrading and, uh, you know, security, configuration management, high availability, like, those are more complex than we'd like them to be. We've gotten so used to how Cloud Foundry works, like, you guys thought about trying to tackle this problem at all? And of course, you know, uh, we, we looked at that and said, well, you know, we've got some expertise in that area. So we went and talked to our friends at Google, you know, Eric Johnson and the, the team there, we've worked closely with them to bring Cloud Foundry to Google Cloud. Uh, and, and this is the Google pla Cloud Platform team, right? Correct, okay. yep. Uh, and so we, we kind of brought this up with them and said, hey, guys, what do you think? Is this something that would be useful to tackle? And they said, well, it's a really interesting question because inside of Google or on Google Container Engine, GKE, uh, we actually run Kubernetes, but there's another layer underneath Kubernetes that makes it operationally efficient, makes it super easy for us to stay up to date on the platform, to resolve uh, CVEs to patch systems, to uh, expand them, contract them, you know, and that, that's based around this technology that we have internally called Borg. But Borg doesn't, we've never released Borg as an open source product, so it's kind of missing, you know, if you want to go run Kubernetes in your own data center, it's not really there. And just fun fact to know and tell, Borg, Bosch, what is it? One letter up from exactly. So yeah, there's a exactly yes. Yeah. So the genesis of the the Bosch pro project uh, actually started with Paul Moritz hiring a couple engineers out of Google as he was launching Cloud Foundry, and they said, "Yeah, this, this really key thing of how we efficiently manage systems at Google, is this Borg thing, we really need a Borg." They said, "But there's some improvements we'd like to make." So the, the project became named Bosch, which is Borg++. Plus Plus. So they incremented the last two letters, right. one, uh, one letter in the alphabet each. And so Google said, yeah, this is really interesting. So we actually started working on this about a year ago. Uh, and then at Google Next, their conference that happened in February, uh, we announced it to the world. We you know, opened up the repos and said, hey, folks, we've been working on this. We'd love to see what... What do you think? Is this oh, wait, useful? And this was Kubo? This was Kubo. Okay. So this Kubo is Kubernetes on Bosch. Kubo Hence for sure. Kubo. Exactly. Right. Uh, and and turned out response to that was terrific. So Google Next is their big user conference. They do it in San Francisco. You know, 10,000 people. Uh, very excited about this project. So excited that we actually had a number of other partners come out and say, hey, how do we get involved? We're really interested in this problem you're trying to solve here. We've got people that are trying to run Kubernetes. We said, okay, that's interesting. 
you know, we really need a good like collaboration and governance model. It shouldn't just be us and Google playing around on GitHub. So since we're both members of Cloud Foundry Foundation, we actually donated the project to CFF. And that happened in June. Uh, and so we've actually been working under the banner of CFF for the last, uh, since June. VMware's joined us. So now we have this three-way partnership. Just this week, I've been talking to a number of the other CFF members. So uh, for clarification, yeah. CFF and CNCF, yes. how are those related? Uh, so CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, is the governing body behind Kubernetes, as well as a few other open source projects. CFF, Cloud Foundry Foundation, okay. governing body behind the Cloud Foundry uh, Okay. And so these, these folks established the model for, you know, how do we determine roadmap? How do we uh, establish who has commit rights? How do we onboard and integrate uh, new contributors to the project? All the important things when you're building a project in a collaborative fashion, uh, particularly amongst companies that may commercially be competing, mm -hmm. but in the interest of building a great uh, product are, are collaborating in the development process. So two really great organizations. Cool, so time to sketch or do we wanna? Yeah, so, so just to finish the story, yep. so what happened this week at Cloud Foundry Summit Europe is the team said, hey, you know, we've, we've now got these two very interesting and complementary projects. We've got uh, what most people think about uh, Cloud Foundry, it's actually the elastic runtime layer and then, and then we now have this Kubo project, and people are a little bit confused about how do they relate? Are they the same? Are they different versions? Are they integrated? Are they built on top of each other? What is it? And so in an attempt to streamline that, the smart marketing folks at, at Cloud Foundry Foundation said, uh, they said, hey, we're gonna simplify the names. So what used to be Cloud Foundry Elastic Runtime is now Cloud Foundry Application Runtime. And Kubo is now Cloud Foundry Container Runtime. Got it. And so now maybe I can draw this out. Yeah. It'll make a little more sense for you. So key components, at the bottom of all of this, we have this layer called Bosch. And a couple important things about Bosch. So Bosch is built to be multi-cloud. So when we talk about being able to run across any public or private cloud platform, Bosch is key to that. And this is where the CPIs come in? Exactly. How so, cloud provider interface, yeah. That's right. So for each of the public clouds <coughs> um, and the private clouds, so you now have Azure Stack, vSphere and uh, an OpenStack. And coming soon, uh, VirtuStream? Uh, you know what? We already run on VirtuStream on, uh, on their vSphere based platform. Uh, so that's, that's available. Um, so Bosch supports all the clouds. And so the great thing about this is you, know, you may be running on premises today on vSphere, but then you know tomorrow you want to deploy an environment on top of Google Cloud Platform and take advantage of their machine learning APIs. Bosch makes this operationally consistent. So to get a Cloud Foundry environment, uh, or excuse me, a app runtime or right, a container right. runtime environment up and running, you know the deployment experience and more importantly the day two operations experience. How do I upgrade or run these things? It's consistent across all these environments. Gotcha. And we can actually extend this. So even, you know, oddly enough, you may have seen the news that Java 1, Oracle, just contributed a new CPI just last week oh, really? for Oracle Cloud Platform. So this continues to expand over time. So the other important thing I want to mention about Bosch, and we won't go deep into the technical detail here, but Bosch embeds an operating system. And so this is a uh, Ubuntu Linux distribution. I know you're close with Mark Shuttleworth yeah. and the team at Ubuntu. Yeah. So we build on top of that uh, that canonical product. We, it's a slim down, just enough OS. Okay. But we take responsibility for maintaining it. 
Okay. So when there's a vulnerability in Linux uh, that's higher critical, we will actually produce a new operating system. In, in, in Bosch speak, we call this a stem cell. Okay. And deliver that to customers within 48 hours of that uh, vulnerability and, and fix being announced. Cool. So that's a really big deal because of that 48 hour SLA and because Bosch can take that operating system, that stem cell artifact, and it can update the entire environment with zero downtime. Well, wow. So if you think about how much time you might spend, uh, spend patching or taking maintenance windows to update operating systems or even being uh, you know, intentionally vulnerable because you can't suffer any application downtime, this zero downtime is a big, big deal. And this comes into a lot of the operational efficiency about why we wanted to marry Bosch with Kubernetes. Gotcha. The other thing, obviously, is we get high availability for free. So Bosch is actively monitoring all the platform components, those VMs, and it will recreate them if one fails. So on top of Bosch, we used to have this thing called Elastic Runtime, or ERT. And honestly, this is what most people thought of when they said Cloud Foundry. It was really that's just the this developer layer. interface, right? Exactly. So if you think about CF Push as your as your experience as a developer, how do I get my code running someplace? I CF Push, and I'm actually sending code to the Elastic Runtime, and the Elastic Runtime is responsible for scheduling containers and maintaining availability. You know, you get you get an experience with this Elastic Runtime of what I like to call platform built containers. So that means all I worry about is my code mm -hmm. and the Elastic Runtime supplies, let's say I'm building a Java app, yep. the JVM, the app server, any security agents or monitoring tools. It creates all, it pulls all those things together and packages up with my code and builds a container for me. And that means that I don't have to worry about upstream dependencies and maintaining them. So as a dev, it's a really simple experience, really quick to get up and running, very efficient from an operational perspective, and highly secure. And this is uh, Run C compliant, OCI compliant? That's right. Okay. So in over the last uh, year or two, we joined the Open Container Initiative, uh, you know, which was, was initially created by the, the good folks at Docker number of other organizations involved now as well. I think CoreOS had a little hand in nudging that. Absolutely. The, the, uh, we, we appreciate Alex's efforts in making that happen. Um, and the idea here is that we now have a standard construct for how do you build a container image and how do you, how do you actually execute it on, a, on an operating system. So OCI has been great in driving some standardization at that interface level. And so the platform in this case in ERT, or what we're now calling the, uh, the Cloud Foundry app runtime. Um, it builds containers for you. So super gotcha. high dev, uh, dev efficiency here. Uh, now what we introduced, right, with this Kubo project, was we said, hey, let's take Kubernetes and put it on top of Bosch. And so Kubernetes, on top of that same Bosch environment that gives you high availability, it gives you an embedded operating system and zero downtime updates. We said, can we add to that this Kubernetes layer and, and deliver similar level of operational efficiency around updates, similar guarantees around availability, because uh, that would be pretty exciting for anybody that's got to run Kubernetes. Because the experience on Kubernetes is not CF push, here's my app code. It's actually, here's a container image, usually a Docker file. Mm -hmm. And you give that to the platform and it schedules it. So the difference here is this is actually usually a developer built container. Gotcha. And this is an important distinction because on this developer-built container, you've shifted the operational responsibility 
for what goes into the runtime upstream. It's happening outside the platform. It may not literally be a human. You can have a system build that container, but it's something external to the Kubernetes environment. Got it. If you use Google Cloud Platform, they actually have something called Container Builder that does this task for you. Um, so there's a potentially a little more developer complexity on this side, but it's really just a different kind of artifact submission. You're submitting app code plus your app server, your JVM, your root file system, all those dependencies necessary to make the thing work. Over here, the platform figures all that out for you. Got it. Now, a lot of people would say, hey, these two things are pretty similar. Like, aren't they just, you know, cloud native? application platforms like why would I ever want them side by side and, and speaking of nomenclature mm -hmm. you've moved on from the PaaS uh, moniker to uh, cloud native app platform is that is that where you're at these days you know who actually started this was uh, a friend of mine Richard Watson at Gartner I'm oh, gonna really? give him uh, credit for this. He wrote a great, uh, great piece of research um, in the last uh, uh, earlier this year. Um, he uh, where he said, "Look, there's this segment in the market because Gartner likes to talk about um, Gartner talks about PaaS as being something like Heroku that it's hosted." And he said, "Hey, what's happening here is people are deploying this on public clouds and on private clouds." And they're managing it themselves with their own operations team in a lot of cases. That's not what we at Gartner think of as a PaaS. So we actually came up with this alternative category where he said, look, this is a cloud native app platform. I really like Got this it. term. Yeah. A little, little more clarity for me anyway. Um, so you know, the, the next question people ask once they understand kind of this basic architecture is, well, what do I run here and what do I run there? Yeah. I was wondering that. Exactly. And the first thing to, to understand is that it's not a, a Venn diagram when you look at these things, right? It's actually a stackable, I, I like to think of it almost like a, a fancy wedding cake. Oh, there you go. Right? And, and so if we draw that out just briefly over here on the side, you know, in this outermost ring, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just call this bare metal hardware, and then inside that, we're going to put... IaaS, and inside that we're going to put, I'm just going to abbreviate uh, CR for container runtime, and then inside, you know, we'll, uh, we'll call this AR for app runtime, and then, uh, you know, we'll put an L there for, for Lambda or an event platform. Um, and the, uh, and so if you look at, if you think about these sort of layers of abstraction. It's not a Venn diagram where there's mutual exclusivity of workload that's appropriate. It's mm -hmm. actually where, look, if I'm willing to install servers and hand configure OSs, I can run literally anything that a computer can do. Right? I have ultimate flexibility there. If I go up to an infrastructure as a service layer, like vSphere or one of the public IaaS platforms, you know, there may be some workloads that just aren't suitable there that you wouldn't necessarily put on the platform. Uh, you know, for a long time in the in uh, VMs, you didn't want to put your databases in VMs in the early days of VMware. I think a lot of people have gotten over that, but there's still some workloads probably that that bare metal is warranted for. I know our financial services customers run some things that they would fall in that category. And if you keep going up the stack here, you know, into the container runtime, there's a lot of things in VMs that work pretty similarly in a container. Mm -hmm. But there's certainly some cases where you wouldn't necessarily do that. And if you go further up the stack, you know, within the, the Cloud Foundry app runtime, there's a set of workloads that I wouldn't, you know, I could run here, but probably doesn't fit here. And finally, if I get up to like an event-driven serverless or functions type platform, like Amazon Lambda, you know, the scope of things I can do there is even, even more restricted. But if you, if you look on the other axis of what, what's capable to run on the platform, the interesting thing is that you move up this, this stack, the, the efficiency of operating and the developer complexity changes. Yep. And so I, I like to think about this and say, hey, as a portfolio owner, if I've got you know, all my enterprise's workloads, my job is not to kind of arbitrarily say everything needs to be in a container runtime. But 
ask questions about how do I get highest dev productivity mm -hmm. and operational efficiency. And that's going to be workload dependent, right? So there's technical suitability kind of coming down this stack, and then there's dev productivity and operational efficiency where if I could, you know, running everything on a nice serverless platform that's hosted and managed by somebody else would be great. I'd have very few operations folks, and my devs have a very narrow scope or surface area of things to think about. Um, so the uh, um, that's how we're starting to think about this. And so just to wrap on the point, you know, introducing this uh, this container runtime opens up the possibility of uh, running things like Spark. Uh. So there's a big effort in the Spark community to run on Kubernetes. Uh, things like Elasticsearch. So this whole area of big data and analytics workloads gets Could really Could you do exciting. Mongo or Cassandra on there? Exactly. Okay. Yep. So some of these distributed database systems that have you know fairly complex consistency models and replication schemes that frankly wouldn't really be a good technical fit on the app runtime suddenly become technically possible and feasible on Kubernetes. You know, there's also this, uh, you know, we'll put databases in here. There's also this category of certain types of legacy tech. And, you know, we can certainly run a large span of application workloads on app runtime, but certain things like classic JEE clustered WebLogic workloads, mm -hmm. like the clustering mechanism in WebLogic not particularly well suited over here. Most of our customers are looking to modernize off of those platforms, quite honestly, but sometimes you've got an app that you need to run but isn't highly valuable. And so, you know, running something like, you know, for JEE on this platform, Java Enterprise Edition, kind of a, you know, a legacy Java stack. And the final thing here is really packaged apps. So, you know, most software vendors have historically sent, um, they've historically, uh, you know, used to send you a DVD mm -hmm. with a readme file or a printed manual and said, here's how you get your, my software up and running. Yeah. It's all on you. More recently, you probably download the software as like a zip file or a tar file off some download depot, but you're still on the hook to install it and configure it and build all the operating systems. What we're starting to see some of the more progressive companies do is say, hey, I'm going to take a lot of the complexity out of that, and I'm actually going to package my software as a Docker file where I include the operating system, the, you know, the root file system, rather, and a lot of the application dependencies, and it's going to come pre-configured. And then all you need to deliver is a container scheduler that can run it. And so in this case, you probably don't own the source code. You don't have the opportunity to make architectural decisions. You just have to run what you get shipped. And so running what you what uh, they ship to you, you know, that packaged apps category uh, is also something that we think we can run on, on Kubernetes. So, you know, if we look at it that way, things like Spring Boot and, you know, your .NET workloads and your Node microservices uh, and then you know, your application architecture starts to complement across these where you've got, you know, stratification of workload mm -hmm. and, and purpose-built runtime uh, supporting both of these, but all delivered with this really powerful Bosch layer underneath. So that's the big news. Very cool. And so, you know, I think with the, um, what you're calling, um, oh gosh, what it is, K, um, with the KE, um, uh, what Container was? runtime? Yeah. Or the PKE is your all's version of it, um, of the GKE. Yeah, so Pivotal, Pivotal uh, announced a um, commercial version of Container Runtime uh, that will GA in December, and we're calling that Pivotal Container Service. Or PKS for short. And once again, this is a nod to GKE, Correct. Right? Which, in, which the K is Kubernetes, even though you'd think it should be a C. That's right. Because that's what container starts with. 
So one of the interesting things about um, one of the interesting things about PKS is we've said uh, we want to maintain constant compatibility with GKE. So when there's a new release of Kubernetes, we just had one I think 10 days or so ago of, of Kubernetes 1.8. Within just a few days, GKE is running that latest version of 1.8. Got it. Because much like uh, you know the the Cloud Foundry ecosystem and App Runtime, both of these products are releasing every 90 days. They're driving a ton of new features into the product. We just released uh, version 1.12 uh, about 10 days ago ourselves. Ourselves. So staying up to date with the latest releases is, is really important for security and new feature parity. And so we've said, hey, with PKS, we're gonna match version for version and similar amount of uh, release frequency as what GKE is able to do. So we're gonna stay constantly compatible there. And the naming scheme obviously is a bit of allusion to it. There are two other things that I wanna mention that are, yep. are in PKS that extend beyond the, the core open source. So I mentioned VMware's gotten involved in this. Don't tell me, let me guess, vSAN and NSX. <laughs> That's right. So, NSX is VMware's software-defined networking product. And so, one of the really cool things that's happening in this space is you've now got all your application code deployed in these containers. Uh, often containers running in VMs, so and you can you can start to build fairly elaborate networking topologies to do really sophisticated things, right? Like you mentioned, Cassandra earlier is a system that you might want to run there. The downside of flexibility and power is that it can get complex quickly. Yeah. And so what we're working with VMware on is that NSX ships as a default part of the PKS system. Uh, so that we can eliminate a lot of that complexity, give a really robust software-defined network uh, and a policy-driven security experience for workload isolation. What VMware likes to refer to as micro-segmentation is the big term that we get with NSX now being at the, the container level. And this NSX layer implemented via Bosch is shared across both these environments. And then the other piece that we've included is something called Harbor. Oh, uh, yeah. So Harbor is a uh, container registry. And this becomes really important when, you're, when your artifact is a Docker file or another container format. You need a place to store all those containers, right? You want them versioned, you want to know that you're deploying something authentic. And so that Docker file uh, can be stored in this platform delivered uh, image registry called VMware Harbor. And so when you buy PKS, uh, either from Pivotal or from VMware or from Dell EMC, it's all the same product. It takes this container runtime open source effort, includes Bosch and Kubernetes, and then we also get NSX and Harbor out of the box fully integrated. And as you mentioned, it also has you know very nice integration into that vSphere environment and also vSAN. Because one of the nice things that Kubernetes is really uh, is really bringing along is the, the ability to do container persistence. Um, so we're pretty excited about the deep integration of vSAN as well. Awesome! Wow, that was a that was quite an edumacation you gave us. <laughs> a lot of confusing stuff. It was good to see it all sketched out. So Ian Andrews, a pleasure as always. Until uh, until next time. Thanks a lot, Martin. I enjoyed it. <laughs>